Okay, welcome everybody to our next uh, installment of the GEP workshop pre-sessions. Pre so uh, today we're going to do an overview and update on the three major science projects that are part of the GEP at present. So first Nate Mortimer is going to present um, a little bit about the WASH project. I'll give you an overview of the Pathways project and then at the end Wilson will do the F element project. We're going to try to stick to about 15 minutes each in terms of presentation time to allow a little time for questions after each talk and hopefully also a little time at the very end for more general discussion, but we'll see, see if that works out well. Um, so uh, Nate and Wilson, I'll, I'll let you know when we're close to 15 minutes on your given presentations and I'll, maybe you can let me know too if I seem to be running over. Um, all right, so Nate's going to take off first. All right, great. Thanks, Laura. Um, thanks, everyone else, for, for coming out to hear about this today. Um, I'm getting the uh, screen share set up here. All right, so, um, so today, um, like Laura said, we're going to give a little bit of an update on the, the scientific projects. Um, and the project that I am the project leader for um, is a project looking at parasitoid wasp genomics. Um, and in particular these days, annotating proteins that encode for venom, or genes that encode for venom proteins. Um, so I wanna start out and just kind of tell you a little bit about um, what my research interests are and what we do in my lab. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the system we use and then talk about how GEP kind of fits into to what we're doing. Um, my main interest is in understanding host parasite interactions. Um, and so what, what we think about this is from a couple of, of dimensions. Um, first, sort of as a cell biologist, um, I'm very interested in understanding how um, parasites are able to manipulate the signaling pathways of their hosts. Um, and then kind of from an evolutionary perspective, I'm very interested in looking at the molecular evolution of these virulence factors that let parasites manipulate their hosts and also the co-evolution between um, hosts and parasites. Um, and sort of this work has, has led us um, into looking at different models of human disease as well. Um, sort of thinking about the immune aspect, both of diseases that we think of as immune diseases like immune deficiencies and autoimmunity, um, but lots of other human diseases that have an immune component. Um, and so the system we use to do this work is uh, parasitoid wasps that infect Drosophila melanogaster. Um, so Drosophila, I don't think, need any um, introduction in this group anymore. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about the wasp. Um, so the species that we work with are all obligate parasitoids of Drosophila. Um, and they are hymenoptera, just like the other bees and wasps that you're kind of familiar with thinking of. Um, only instead of a stinger, um, in our parasitoids, it's been modified to function as an ovipositor. And so what that means is when they are infecting their host, they kind of are stinging their host. And when they do that, they're inserting an egg along with these venom proteins into the body cavity of the fly larva, which, which serves as their host. Um, now these venoms are what we're really interested in or what I'm really interested in um, because these are the proteins that the wasp is able to use to remote, remotely manipulate um, the host signaling, right? So it does kind of the obvious things you'd expect Right, so it's gonna block the host's immune response to this paras parasitization um, event. Um, but it can also do things like change the host metabolism. Um, it changes the host development rate. Um, so they can do a lot of really interesting things to their host after infection. Um, and from what we know, a lot of these venom proteins are actually targeting highly conserved signaling pathways. Um, and a lot of these signaling pathways are linked to human diseases. And so that's kind of how we ended up studying this, this group of human diseases at the same time. Um, and so what our real focus is, is understanding how these venom proteins are able to manipulate these conserved signaling pathways. Um, and as I'll kind of show you, we think about the gene annotation and, and the models that the students are producing um, are sort of fodder both for doing bioinformatic analysis to look at um, the evolution um, and also to help support our molecular biology experiments. Um, and so when we're thinking about genome annotation, of course, the first thing we think about is the genome browser. So I just wanted to kind of show you a little shot of what we have for the WASP. Um, it has a lot of the tracks you're probably used to thinking about. 
Um, we have our genome sequence, RNA sequence, um, you know, the gene predictions. Um, but we also have one track that's a little bit unique. Um, and that is because we've done a lot of proteomics on this venom, and I built a, a genome browser track that actually maps all of the peptides onto the genome. And so if you look along the top here, um, that's actually what all of these little boxes represent, is these are um, the peptides that we found by doing venom mass spec, or venom proteomics, um, mapped onto the genome, um, which is kind of a, a nice way I've found to um, talk to students about how different levels of omic technologies can actually be integrated to, to answer a question. Um, and you probably won't be surprised to hear that the gene models that were automatically sort of produced for us using these bioinformatic tools are not great. Um, and so this is where the students come in with their manual annotations improving these gene models um, so that we can study the genes that encode these venom proteins in, in a much more rigorous way. Um, so I kind of want to take a couple of minutes and talk about the goals of, of this annotation project. Um, so we'll start with kind of the big picture, right? So you probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that what we're interested in is sort of using comparative genomics to understand the evolution of these venom encoding genes. Um, and there are quite a number of what I think are interesting um, molecular evolution questions we can ask by looking at these. Um, and so to do this work, it of course requires the annotation of the venom encoding genes um, across multiple species that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and also annotating some non-venom genes to use as comparisons. Um, but that obviously is gonna be, you know, many, many years worth of work, you know, hundreds and potentially even thousands of genes that we need to annotate. Um, and I'm not that patient when I think about science. So what I've tried to do is to also break um, this big picture question down into some smaller, more focused projects, um, sort of projects where we can ask um, a very simple, a very targeted question, um, and then we can go out and using gene annotation, collect the data that will let us get an answer to that question, while at the same time contributing sort of the annotation to our big picture project that we want to do in the longer term. Um, I'll quickly mention, um, because Molly mentioned it on, uh, on Monday when she was doing the science and IT wrap up um, that we have our first little pilot project was looking at lipid synthesis. Um, the annotation is all done. So thank you to everyone who was involved in that. Um, we're working on the reconciliation now and we'll be getting some wet lab work going to complement that in the near future as well. Um, and then what I wanna tell you about today um, is two projects, two newer projects that we're working on um, and these will be things that we'll want to have um, classes involved in annotating genes for over the next couple of years. Um, so the first of these is going to be sort of from the evolution side, the comparative genomics side, um, where we think there are a lot of very specific, interesting questions we can ask. Um, and so I'll tell you about the first of those today. Um, and then I wanna wrap up and I wanna tell you a little bit about um, one of the projects in the lab that's sort of driven by the cell biology of the system and seeing how um, the gene annotation can actually help support those projects as well. Um, so we'll start out thinking about the comparative genomics. Um, and as the word, the title suggests, obviously we need to have multiple species to compare. Um, and so when we think about this project, um, as of now, we're thinking really about four species. Um, I've got some money, so we'll be sequencing a couple more over the next year or two and adding them in. Um, so this tree may look different in a few years time, hopefully will. Um, the first three species on this list are uh, parasitoids of Drosophila that we study in my lab. Um, and these are the ones where we've done the mass spec to identify all of the venom proteins. Um, and these are all also endoparasites. And so what that means is they lay their egg um, directly into their host and the parasite offspring develops in the internal environment of the host. Um, sort of the reference parasitoid species is Nisonia. Um, and this work has been done by other labs. They've identified all of the venom proteins from Nisonia. And interestingly, all of the species have roughly the same number of venom proteins. Um, Nisonia are ectoparasites, which means they lay their egg and the offspring mostly develop sort of external to their host. Um, and eventually they can move inside and eat, but sort of the, the early developmental events are, are outside the host. Um, and so I have uh, a PhD student, Ashley Waring, who um, was really interested in 
looking at the um, relationships between these different venoms, the, the components of these different venoms. Um, and something she found that, that we were really excited by is actually 36 protein families that we find in all the venoms of all three of our Drosophila infecting endoparasite species. And none of these families are actually found in the Sonia. Um, so that kind of leads us to the idea that maybe we found some ancestral venom proteins is kind of our, our working title for the project. Um, and that these may be sort of a core set of proteins that are required for being an endoparasite, um, possibly specifically for infecting Drosophila. Um, and so we're kind of very interested in, in looking at this. Um, and I'll share a little bit of Ashley's preliminary data. Um, so the protein families that she's found kind of broke, break down into these three categories. Um, the first of which is metabolism. And as you can see, it's kind of a, a widespread um, look at metabolism. Um, and we think this is all part of the um, parasite sort of making the host a more nutritious environment for its offspring to develop in. Um, a lot of structural proteins, um, specific subunits of cytoskeletal genes, for instance. Um, we're not quite sure what's going on there. It might tie into the venom transport I'm going to tell you about in a couple of minutes. Um, and then a handful of proteins that we either know or suspect are going to be immune effector proteins, um, like serpins, which are serine protease inhibitors. And they actually block a lot of the early signaling events that happen um, in an insect immune response. And so that's kind of the protein evolution side that Ashley is working on. Um, the GEP specific project is that we want to look at um, sort of the evolution of these genes. Um, and so I kind of did a quick look across these protein families that Ashley um, has discovered across the three species. Um, and a lot of these families actually have multiple members, both um, within the venom and outside the venom in, in some of the species. And so we think in total, we're going to want to annotate um, about 300 total transcripts, which will be both the venoms and the non-venom paralogs across these three species. Um, and we think this will let us answer um, a number of interesting questions, um, sort of within comparative genomics and phylogenetics. Um, we're particularly interested in sort of testing our hypothesis um, to see whether these genes are all representative of the state of some common ancestor, or is this more likely to be a convergent evolution? Um, I think it'll be very interesting to look at. And of course, the, the gene models that the students are going to um, annotate for us are gonna be the sort of the key um, experimental data that we're gonna use to do these analyses. Um, I'll just quickly change gears and tell you a little bit about one of the cell biology experiments that we're working on. Um, this is focused on one of the wasp species, um, that we work with Ganaspis. Um, and this is a wasp that we're very interested in, in kind of understanding its venoms. Um, do we know a little bit about it functionally and what it does is really kind of cool. Um, so we know that for immune responses and in general conserved across pretty much all animals, um, one of the initial events after infection is an increase in intracellular calcium signaling. Um, and in previous work, we had shown that if you block this calcium signaling, you actually block immune cell activation. And so there's never an immune response triggered. Um, and so then along came Ganaspis, and we found that um, its venom actually contains a calcium pump. And that what it does is it injects this pump into the host, it goes to the immune cells, and then pumps out all of the calcium. So it blocks um, an immune response from ever being triggered. Um, and that's, I think, kind of a cool story. Um, but it got even more interesting when we started thinking about what this calcium pump is. It's, it's a protein called Circa. Um, it's highly conserved in, in pretty much all animals. Um, but as you might imagine, for an ion pump, it's a multi-pass transmembrane protein. Um, so it has this huge hydrophobic region. Um, and when we think about venoms, we're thinking about an aqueous environment of proteins being transferred between species. And that really doesn't seem likely for Circa. Um, so we wanted to start thinking about how that might happen. Um, and so this was really work done by um, Chris Lark, who was a master's um, student in the lab who just graduated and we're really sad to see him go off and get a job elsewhere. Um, but Chris decided that he wanted to tackle this question. Um, and so what he wanted to do was to isolate active circa from whole venom. 
And then he wanted to look for other proteins that isolated along with it, along with other biomolecules, and see if that could give us some kind of insight into how it was actually being transported. Um, and so Chris did this using a sucrose gradient approach, um, where basically we have our, our um, tube with a gradient of sucrose in it, um, add the protein in on the top, spin it really hard for a really long time, and eventually all of the venom components will separate out by density, sort of the least dense um, at the top and most dense at the bottom. Um, and Chris was kind of thinking about this in terms of potential venom components with the idea that sort of individual proteins would be the least dense, um, then protein complexes, and then much more complicated structures like vesicles would be a lot more dense. Um, and so what Chris did is he fractioned the venom, then looked to see where circa was found. Um, he actually found that it was in the most dense fraction of all, um, and that that fraction alone has the whole activity, uh, or the venom, sorry, the activity that you see in a whole venom. Um, this fraction is just full of charged lipids, uh, which kind of ruined our first attempt at mass spec. Um, and so we cleaned that up and tried again. And we found about 90 proteins in this fraction. Um, a lot of these proteins are known to be components of exosomes and involved in membrane trafficking. So along with the charged lipids, we think we're kind of onto something with this idea that um, these transmembrane venom proteins might be transported in some kind of vesicle. Um, it's also interesting, there are a bunch of metabolic enzymes jammed in there too, so we want to sort of test that, um, those functions as well. Um, and then what we really want to do is to be able to get good gene models for all of these proteins, so we can then move into um, doing some in vitro work where we're looking at the activities of these proteins um, and the ability to assemble, to assemble um, these vesicles in vitro. Um, so I ran out right about 17 minutes, just like okay. Oh, so, so this is kind of the end. So if you're interested in being um, a part of this, um, all the information is on the Trello board. Um, so if you join the board, you'll get any announcements about the project and you can email me directly. Um, and then I just sort of want to acknowledge the, the people who do all of the work in the lab and then also the sources of funding that we have. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. So Nate, can I yeah. quickly ask you something? Um, of course. Um, let me just start my video. Um, so uh, are you guys doing anything other than just the gene annotation? Have, I, with GP students, are you doing protein stuff as well, protein structure um, predictions? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so with my class, um, and I think with a few other people as well, um, we kind of take these sequence, protein sequences that we're predicting. Um, we're looking for conserved domains. We're doing some functional annotation. We're doing motif finding with the proteins. Um, I've started doing some 3D structure prediction with them as well. Um, eventually, I think we'd like to um, create some curriculum that, that goes along with all of those things. Um, right, that was my been, next question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's just been me kind of playing around with it with my students. Um, but I think it would fit in with, with some of the other things that people are interested in doing in, in terms of curriculum. Um, so I'd be very interested in working on that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Nate, really quick question. When you say like the three groups of venoms and you said something metabolic enzymes, are the venoms targeting or like inhibiting metabolic enzymes or are they like sequence or structural similarity to, to the enzymes? I could not um, yeah, yeah. So, so as of right now, that's all based on um, just sequence, sequence similarity. Um, we, we were in the process of starting a metabolomics project to actually see how um, venom being introduced into the host changes the metabolism of the host. That's kind of on hold until the lab reopens. Um, uh, but but as you're thinking, like you isolate something through sucrose density gradient, mm -hmm. if the metabolic enzymes, is it that the venoms target, like bind the enzymes and that's why they're core, you know, segregating together in the density oh, gradient? Or so, is it like, so could the venoms be the inhibitors and not? Yeah, the so the, all of these things are found in isolated venoms. So this is before infection. 
So we know that the venoms have these proteins that have this similarity. Um, we're not yet sure if they're going to be functional enzymes or if they might act as dominant negatives. Um, a couple of the, of the things we've looked at just by sequence, we think they might be dominant negative proteins. Um, so we're kind of interested to see exactly how, exactly what impact they have on, on metabolism in the host cells. And are you guys cloning the venom genes? Um, well, as soon as we have good gene models, we're going to. <laughs> uh -huh, not, okay. All right, well, thank you. And if there's any questions later, um, feel free to get in touch.